Let's bring in our panel now to talk about the latest on the impeachment of President Trump, Mike DeBonis, Franco Ordonez, and Kim Whaley. Mike is a congressional reporter for The Washington Post. Franco is a White House correspondent for NPR. And Kim is a CBS News legal analyst and former associate independent counsel in the Whitewater investigation. Welcome to all of you. Great to have you with us. Mike, let me begin with you. As we mentioned, the House Judiciary Committee is meeting tonight to debate articles of impeachment. Tell us how that's going to play out exactly. Uh, so this is going to be a two-day affair. They're going to start tonight. Hopefully, they're they're hoping to get some of the speeches out of the way. There's just going to be a lot of uh, 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 members of this committee who are going to want to basically make their feelings on this impeachment pro and con. Uh, they're hoping to get that out of the way tonight. Tomorrow, move to uh, Republican amendments. Uh, they're expecting a number of uh, uh, messaging type uh, amendments to come forward. You know, th this is the last stop before this uh, impeachment hits the House floor. It's like third base, the last stop before home. Uh, this is going to be them setting up, passing these articles, sending them to the House floor for uh, what is likely to be for only the, the third time in American history, the House uh, voting to impeach a president. And when are we likely to see that House vote, Mike? Well, that depends on a number of other things. There's a, quite a uh, pileup of business here in the House uh, these last couple weeks before Christmas. Uh, right now, they're in the middle of a spending negotiation with Repub the Democrats in the House, Republicans in the Senate, uh, the White House. If they can make some progress on that by the end of this week, they're hoping to do that first thing next week, uh, vote on that Tuesday, then move to impeachment Wednesday, Thursday. But if that uh, spending negotiation holds up, we could see a vote as soon as Tuesday day on the president's impeachment. All right, but it's looking like it's coming before Christmas. Um, Franco, we know Congress, as we just heard Mike say, has a busy schedule next week. But what exactly is on the White House agenda? Well, they're certainly pushing back. I mean, they got all, all pistons firing. They got their uh, rapid response team, you know, putting out tweets, sending out messages, making sure that they get their perspective signed. We just heard from President Trump last night that they're continuing to keep the same message that this is a sham, uh, that this is a partisan fight. Uh, and their, their plan is to keep that message going. I mean, they're trying to do fundraising. They're trying to bank on this. This is something that they had, you know, in many ways hoped for from the beginning to turn this into a partisan battle. Uh, and in many ways, they've been able to do this, uh, get away from some of the substance and keep this a Republican versus Democrats fight. And Kim, we heard President Trump call this the, quote, lightest, weakest impeachment. You wrote in The Atlantic today the House's two charges against Mr. Trump, quote, get right to the point, are easy to prove, and precisely describe the threat the president poses to American democracy. Help us understand what you mean by that. Okay, so the first is abuse of power, and all four of the legal um, experts and pro-law professors, including our own uh, Jonathan Turley, testified before the House Judiciary Committee that abuse of power is squarely envisioned as a basis for impeachment. And the reason for that, particularly with respect to an election, is that an election cannot heal or address a president's using the power of the office to get reelected. That has to to have some intervening event, that is, impeachment. And here we've got the July 25th transcript that lays out the request for the investigations, and we have the $391 million hold that, to date, has not been explained, except by virtue of leverage uh, against the Ukrainians, and $35 million of that was not released on time, uh, was not released at all because of the timing. And, of course, to date, we still have not seen a White House meeting with Ukrainian President Zelensky. Uh, although we, the Russians were there just this week. So that the basic facts of that uh, sort of exchange are laid out. The second article of impeachment is obstruction of the United States Congress itself. Also, un, absolutely unrefuted that this president has told anyone who's essentially worked for him with any personal knowledge, you cannot, we, I do not want you to testify, and has not turned over a single document. The way that our separation of powers works is that the branches cooperate with each other and that oversight is inherent in the separation of powers. The House of Representatives has the, quote, 
sole power of impeachment under the Constitution. You don't really need a federal court to come in and say that means Congress can exercise its impeachment power. It's as plain as day in the highest uh, legal document in the land. So that's a pretty straightforward uh, charge as well, and quite serious if we as Americans want to retain a Congress with vitality to oversee the office of the executive branch. It is different from Ken Starr's Whitewater investigation that I worked on in that there was a independent counsel that had years of grand jury powers to gather information. In this moment, the only way that would have happened would be through William Barr. Um, and, of course, William Barr was not uh, oversaw the decision not to even turn over the whistleblower complaint. So, absent this process, through the House actually developing the record, we as Americans would not even know necessarily what went on here. And, Kim, you also note the importance of the articles Democrats chose not to include. Do you believe that they've come up with sort of a cleaner, leaner machine? Yes. Yeah, so, bribery uh, is expressed in the Constitution, which is unusual, but there is a 2016 Supreme Court case that makes it harder to bring a criminal bribery charge against politicians. And that could have gotten a little murky uh, for the Democrats. In addition, they did not bring a, a standalone obstruction of justice, as distinct from obstruction of Congress, mm -hmm. that is, relating to the president's established efforts in the Mueller report to basically shut down the Mueller investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election. Uh, I, I suspect that, again, could have muddied the waters, complicated things, given Republicans a lot of tangents to move off of. Um, but as Franco just indicated, the defense really here is not—doesn't appear to be on the facts. That is, the Republicans have not come up with a coherent narrative to undermine the basic story here. The facts are, are largely unrefuted. The argument is essentially, um, A, it doesn't matter, or right. B, let's assail, attack the Democrats and make it about the Democrats politically rather than what the president did and whether that's a serious problem for the Constitution. And so, Franco, off Kim's point there, let's look ahead to the potential impeachment trial in the Senate as it's looking more and more likely that's where this is going. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham told CBS News senior investigative correspondent Catherine Herridge what he wants to see from an impeachment trial. Let's listen. When it comes to the impeachment trial, I don't want to blow the whole country up. I don't want to turn it into the circus. I don't want Pompeo to come. I don't want Pence to come. I don't want Hunter Biden to come. I don't want Joe Biden to come. I want to get it over with. And you don't want Giuliani to come. I don't want Giuliani to come. I want to end this based on the record they assembled in the House. Mm -hmm. I understand there's a lot of emotion here. The sooner we can get this behind us, the better. Lindsey Graham wants a quick and dirty trial. Uh, Franco, how is that different from what the White House seems to want? <laughs> Well, the White House wants a, a White House wants a show. I mean, they have very publicly called that they want uh, Adam Schiff, Representative Adam Schiff, Chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, to testify. Uh, they've talked about wanting Hunter Biden, the son of Vice President Joe Biden, uh, who is at the center of the some of these allegations by Republicans uh, that Hunter Biden was improperly uh, on the board of an energy company in Ukraine. Uh, they the Republicans argue for that there was corruption involved, which there's been no proof of, no evidence of that. Uh, they also would like the whistleblower. The White House would also like the whistleblower uh, to testify. But as you just pointed out, Lindsey Graham disagrees. Lindsey Graham is one of the closest allies to President Trump, uh, and he's not the only Republican who is, who is saying this. Other Republicans, other Republican leaders in the Senate um, are saying the same thing. They're saying, what have, what have we not already heard? They want to move on. They want to get this done. And I think a lot of that speaks to not wanting to drag this out and keep this where it is and as a political battle as opposed to kind of a legal battle, but more of a political fight, which is what an impeachment thing is in the end. Sure. And, Mike, you reported last week Republicans are dramatically outspending Democrats on impeachment-related ads, which understandably must be worrying vulnerable House Democrats in those districts that lost, uh, you know, that, that uh, Trump won in 2016. So today we learned Michael Bloomberg is donating $10 million to the campaign arm of the House Democratic Caucus to protect some of those vulnerable House Democrats. Um, you know, will, will that help? What do you think, you know, what do you think will calm their worries? 
Well, th there's certainly a lot of anxiety out there. They wanted, you know, Democratic Party organization spending, you know, yesterday, a month ago, uh, backing them up. But, you know, there's there's really been an attitude uh, in the Democratic Party world that, you know, not to overreact at this moment, to wait until uh, Democrats put some policy wins on the board. The House is expected to vote tomorrow on a big prescription drug bill. I think that they want to highlight that. They want to highlight the trade deal that's likely to pass next week and, and go up and really counter this Republican messaging campaign with Democrats' own message, which is we're actually delivering on our agenda on things like lowering prescription drug prices, things like that. So I, I think that, you know, this $10 million Bloomberg uh, uh, donation is certainly noteworthy. Um, you know, the thinking here has been less about the money and more about what the message is going to be and how, mm -hmm. how you're going to be most effective sending it. All right. Mike DeBonis, Franco Ordonez, and Kim Whaley, thanks to all of you. We really appreciate it.